This episode of The Soap Sanctuary discusses topics that many may find sensitive or triggering. This video is meant to entertain, evaluate, and possibly educate. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys, it's DC and welcome to the Soap Sanctuary where all soap lovers are welcome. This is my Soap Sanctuary character analysis review on controversial soap opera characters. Um, and yes, you see the disclaimer at the beginning of the episode. Uh, this is because this is going to be a thorough character uh, analysis with some sensitive topics. Um, I love my reviews of the current soaps and their storylines but I wanted to examine past character and storylines. And that's the best thing about soaps that have material for days. There's so much to unpack. And you know me guys, I have watched The Divine Nine of Soaps, which was All My Children, One Night to Live, General Hospital, As Well Turns, Young Restless, Bold and Beautiful, Guide and Light, Days Our Lives, and Passions. And just recently I've been started watching Another World um, online. So I really wanted to be able to do uh, this video. Like I said, I love uh, the last character analysis I did on GH's Portia. Um, and YNR's name, um, but this wasn't. This is this whole video. Right, I'm gonna be honest. Is inspired by a paper that I'm writing for my uh, human sexuality class. Sorry, my sexuality class. Um, and I won't say exactly verbatim what the topic of that paper is or the topic I chose to write about. But I formulated my paper around basically the topic of how our inherent sexual desires form our personalities as people. And as I was writing this paper, writing different things and different things and different topics started sparking the mind. And I thought about this topic, which I'm gonna to try to refrain from using the R word in this video as much as possible. Um, and then I was like, oh my God, I started thinking about these soap characters. So I didn't put that in the paper, the soap character part, but you know, I was starting to think about this. I was like, you know, I wanna do a soap, a soap video on this. I think it'll be perfect. Um, and I wanna start exploring archetypes. That's one of the biggest things. I want to explore archetypes. Um, the thing is that when first, when soaps first started, uh, characters were kind of written with, a one-dimensional kind of archetype. They were either good or bad, this or that. And this was around the 1930s and 1950s when soaps first began. But it wasn't until then, starting around the late 60s, that characters were then written with a little bit more complexity, right? It wasn't that they were just this or that. They was like, okay, they're good, but they also have this side to that, right? And now we're exploring this, this two-dimensional character that is existing before us. So before we go off into the first controversial solo character, which is Roger Thorpe on Guiding Light, I want to give a little bit of a backstory to some of you soap viewers who may just only be GH fans, only YNR fans, or whatever, um, about the character of Roger Thorpe. Now, one of the biggest things that made Roger Thorpe's storyline with particularly Holly Thorpe as controversial is because this was one of the first few times in daytime and. I think possibly on TV at that time, that a wife would be accusing her husband of like a violation like that, right? <sighs> so much to dissect in that. But anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and cue this video, cue this clip, and we're gonna have a discussion right afterwards. Cue the clip. Hey, don't you know? touch me. Don't touch me! I'm your husband! What is this don't touch me stuff? Let go of me, please. I wonder. If Ed Bauer would have any better luck than I've been having with you. Ah! Please, just, I don't want to talk. Leave me alone, please. Just... I want to talk about Ed. I want to talk about Ed. Beloved of all, especially my wife. Let me ask you something, Holly. You're the perfect person to ask this. How do I compare to Ed, huh? Why the silence? Why so shy? You're the one who always said we should talk more. Come on, I want to hear it from your own sweet lips. Leave here. You wouldn't want to leave if, if I was Ed, would you? You wouldn't be so, such a hurry to cut out from me like you're cutting out from my miserable life. You'd probably be in a sack with him right now. <laughs> you want to try that again? 
When you were with me that night, it was there, and you know it too. What is wrong with you? Our marriage was vicious and brief. Our divorce is a smashing success by comparison. And why? Because we managed to stay out of each other's way. Roger, you have made so much more of yourself alone than you ever would have with me. And now suddenly my, your, your, your future depends on, on having me back? You let me taste it again, Holly. You no. showed me that you no. wanted to... Yes! No. Yes! Holly. It's not me that you can't live with. You know what it is? It is the shame that crept in after we made love. That's what it is. After you reverted back to what you like to think of as Holly... Norris Bauer Thorpe Lindsay again. The shame of loving someone that you're supposed to find is fickle, and that's why you run to Ed. I run away from you. I don't run to Ed. My life and his are so separate now. There's this... You're lying! But it doesn't matter. You think he's going to want you once he learns that you slept with me? Roger? If I can't have you, he sure as hell is not going to. Okay, guys, there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to unpack there, right? Roger Thorpe was a very complex man, and you could see the views he held, even with him telling Holly, don't touch you, I'm your husband. Um... The thing about it is viewers at that time didn't know how to feel about the storyline, some even to this day. And yes, I do know some people who were watching Guiding Light during this time. And from what they told me, they didn't know how to feel about this storyline. Um, the reason why this storyline was very controversial is because I think it sparked the question, right? That when there's considered a sexual violation, right? Between woman and man or just partners in general, right? Um, usually it's seen as like in a, just as simply the context of a relationship or the people don't know each other or they're somewhat estranged, right? But what made this very controversial, I think the, where, the point where viewers didn't know how to feel about it was that this was a wife accusing her husband, right? So, and guys, I'm gonna talk about all this objectively here. Please don't be super sensitive when I'm talking about this. This is all from an objective point of view. That's why I put that disclaimer at the beginning of the video, all right? I wasn't really sure if you know, some of my viewers had the capacity to have these kind of conversations. I know so fans can be crazy, okay? Um, but this is all coming from a objective point of view. This is not my point of view, but I'm saying, looking at this objectively, what the potential other point of views could have been surrounding these storylines. So please keep that in mind, okay, as I go through this video, all right? I'm not all super politically correct as I'd like to be, but I'm learning, and this is part of that, this is part of what this video is about, okay? I just gotta put that out there for the, for the, for the record, okay? But one of the controversies that was with this storyline was that a wife was accusing her husband of this. And I think, like I said, the reason why I think viewers didn't know how to feel about this because it's like, you have a child this man. The thing that you're accusing him of, that he's forcing you, that's forcing upon you, that's not consensual, you were doing this, you were more than likely or presumably doing this with him, maybe not even that morning, the day before that, or the day before that. And the people that I knew that watched Guy at that time, they told me that was a thing they couldn't understand either. They couldn't get it. Um, it was seemingly kind of strange for them. But see, these storylines made us as viewers, I say as if I was around that time, I wasn't even a fetus then, but they made us as viewers think. It brought complexities to characters which made us think, right? So even Holly, Holly faced her own complexities. Our marriage was vicious and brief, you know? Because again, she's coming to desire the man she faced violence with, right? And so she's probably wondering, as a woman, right? Or just even as an individual, why am I desiring the same man who did this? Am I forgiving him? Am I putting him in this past? Am I putting myself in a position for this to happen to me again? There's so many complexities. And I understand, I'm going at this in a, in a, in a so in-depth look, right? But this is how soaps were analyzed back in the day, like how we, do, we, we would do reality shows, okay? But Holly had her own complexities that she was facing. Um, this even, even looking at um, Ben Mitchell from EastEnders. I know some of you guys don't watch British soaps, so I'm just gonna give, I'm just gonna touch on that for a quick hot second. This is just a recent storyline the past year or so. So Ben Mitchell's a character on the British soap opera EastEnders, and he's married to his husband, uh, Officer Callum. Callum, I think it is. I might be butchering the name. Bear with me, guys. 
So there is a storyline arc in East Enders where Ben Mitchell is sexually violated by another man, right? However, what I see is a potential controversy with that storyline or something that could make the viewers go, I don't know how I feel about this. The man that sexually violated Ben Mitchell, minding you, he's married and it's not his husband, but this man, he met up with this man with the intention to have sex, to ultimately cheat on his husband, right? Um, so it was like a weird in between. And like in the middle of it, then he might decide, okay, you know what, this might not be for me, but he was already drugged and then the act took place. And so what I saw as a viewer watching Colum go through this, Colum, I think at first just only knew that Ben cheated. That was the only thing that was in his mind, right? And I think there was proof of that through other stuff. But then came to find out that Ben was actually violated, right? And it's it's an interesting dynamic because you feel for Ben, right? I'm sure as Colum is his husband, he feels for him. He feels like, wow, this happened to you, I love you. But then I'm sure there's also probably an inkling in his mind, like you went there with the intention to go sleep with this man. And in a sense, sexual acts did take place with this man, but now it's another context. However, you had intended to go there to have sexual acts with the man. And that would just have taken place in a different context. So a sexual act was in your intention of going there. It's just now it just happened in a different context. So how do I reconcile that within my mind, right? Unless I, in some type of way, develop a cognitive dissonance and put one concept or one idea to the side so I can properly digest the other. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you guys? Does that make sense? Like I'd have to put this idea to the side that you went there to have an affair to cheat on me so I could digest the fact that you were sexually violated and I could be there for you, right? So with Holly and Guy in Light, man, I wish I had Candace Mack with me. Where's Candace Mack when you need her? She, she's, she's, she's a Guy Light historian, but I saw those complexities of Holly's face because I watch a lot of pastoral lines on soaps. You guys, I'm just watching current soaps. I watch past soaps too. I watch a lot of soaps. And I, I, I understand the complexity she faced because it's like, how do you go back to that man who violated you? How do you desire him? How does that work? How does that work? And the thing is with Roger Thorpe, we saw him develop over time, right? He was this bad guy who did these things to Holly, but then he became almost like, this beloved Lothario and villain that we had on Guy in Light, right? And it's interesting as viewers as back then, I'm saying as if I was living there, I'm just, I guess I'm maybe through osmosis, I <laughs> understand what they felt, right? How do we reconcile that, right? How do we reconcile those things as viewers, right? This is why these characters are controversial, right? Because now, if a character like Roger Thorpe came in with that type of introduction with storyline of violation like that, he would be thrown away, right, on the soap. We wouldn't develop him out. We wouldn't see how he dealt with these things and these dynamics over time, right? But there is one character that I do want to talk about that is very controversial that did deal with his dynamic all throughout his storyline arcs on the show. And that is none other than Todd Manning on One Life to Live. Now, Todd Manning's storyline with Marty and that violation, the KD campus and all that other stuff and that whole trial that took place, um, it was a complexity within Todd because the writers would never let him forget what he did to Marty. They never did. If you notice, they never really let him forget that. Um, they never let Todd forget that and that was something that he really lived and he, we watched that journey that of him living with it, reconciling what he did throughout the show. All right, but before I go any further, check out these scenes. Key video. Maybe you have a conscience after all. I have a conscience and a memory. There's only one memory I'm interested in, Marty. You know that. You know where I was at 11 o'clock, right when somebody else tried to rape Rebecca. You're my alibi. I could be. So go ahead. Say it. You're going to go to the DA, and you're going to tell him the truth. Say it. Marty. I'll tell you what I'm going to say. Never. I will never be your alibi. And you talk about conscience. How do you like your creation, Todd? Ever since you and your buddies raped me, this is the first time I'm in control. That's what this is about, isn't it? Power. Oh, you bet it is. 
Now you're the one pinned to the bed with a sweatband stuffed in your mouth. You're the one who can scream and cry and no one can hear you. I'm the one staring down at you, laughing. I'm the one who's going to haunt your dreams for the rest of your life. How does it feel to be powerless, Todd? How does it feel to be afraid? Now, there's a lot for us to see them pack in these scenes. How problematic is it that Todd held it over Marty's head that you need to you need to save Rebecca Lewis? Like almost like it's on you if another man does that to another woman. I'm like, what? And it's like, Todd, like you and that man are in the same WhatsApp group. You know, the, like you're 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 kind of cut from that same cloth too, which I think Todd was aware of. I think what made it worse with Todd and probably harder for us to get over that was when he did it again to Blair, right? Um, and it was like, damn, you know, we, we, we were finally moving past that storyline because that storyline was a huge arc, a huge trial. This is how Nora was brought to Landview as Todd's attorney, right? Defending him in the case and Todd won. And that was crazy, right? So there was no justice for Mark in that sense, which I didn't like how they killed her off in the end, but you know, Carla Body apologized about that. I'm just gonna let it go. I'm just gonna let it go, okay? Um, but this storyline for me was realistic because in real life, we don't get over trauma in like six months like how they do on soaps. We don't, we live with it, right? Marty lived what Todd did to her this whole time. We got to see her journey. Although I will say, in contrast, we saw more of Todd's journey with it than we did Marty. I understand uh, Susan Haskell was on the show as much and whatever and all those different dynamics came to play. Um, and this is the thing I've noticed with soaps is that when it comes to these kind of storylines, we're always seeing this almost, it seems like from the accused point of view, which is unique because most shows, especially on primetime, would actually chronicle how we would see the character deal with this from strictly the victim's point of view and not the perpetrator, right? The person who actually committed the crime. We would never really get to see their point of view, right? So to me, that was kind of unique that we got to see how they lived with these things. Now, the thing is, is that many viewers seem to really move past what Todd did on My Life to Live. And I'm sure that many viewers would even regard Todd Manning as one of the best, uh, One Life to Live's best characters. I would agree. Now, when I say best character, I didn't mean that he was a good guy. Let's be clear about that. Let's discern those two, right? but the best well-written character. Because this complexity when the Todd made you really think about what type of person he was, right? Um, he was definitely a very blurred archetype of a man. And when Star was born, now we're seeing this part of Todd that is paternal, right? Who is Who, who loves his daughter. And I think the writers intentionally did that given uh, Todd's history and histrionic relationship with women, that his first child is gonna be a woman, right? The first child is gonna be a girl, right? So. To me, I thought that was very interesting. And the thing about it is, is that it made me think about sexual crimes, right? I'm not trying to get so politicized on this subject, but I'm really just trying to open up objective dialogue. And this is what soaps really did back in the day, especially Agnes Nixon soaps. They made you think. It wasn't about black or white or this and that. When I say black and white in terms of this or that, right? In terms of the characters. It really made you think like what was going before you. It made me think about sexual crimes, right? They're very unique in how we view them from other crimes, right? Um, so if you look at sexual crimes versus violent crimes, which given sexual crimes, I think are violent crimes, they're synonymous, I think that's kind of like a given. But just for a moment, let's separate just for a moment sexual crimes from violent crimes. That's as if they're just two separate entities, right? A sexual crime is viewed, how do I say this? As more immoral at times, than a actual violent crime, right? So let me give you a comparison here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the two groups here the same so you can see what I'm talking about. So if a man is 35 years old, he kills another 35 year old man, he's a murderer, he's in jail, right? If a man is 35 years old and violates another man who's also 35 years old, he's in jail. He's committed sexual crime. However, that man who has committed sexual crime is held in more contempt more than likely we have more contempt than the one who was a murderer, right? Even though that every crime could have its context. And context is like the background, the circumstances revolving around those potential crimes, right? 
And what I mean by that is, I think that's an interesting dynamic. One takes life, one violates a life, right? And I think it's obviously the trauma. There's more of a trauma that is associated with sexual crimes than there are violent crimes, right? And guys, I'm not politically correct. I don't know if I'm saying everything correctly. Listen, I'm just having this dialogue and this discussion. Because that's how personal I am. I think about these things. Um, and then it brings up the conversation of redemption, non-redemption, what qualifies for that? What I found interesting about Todd and Marty is that they never fell in love. They, the writers, writers to me, what, I'm, what it seemed like to me, they never really had them fall in love. It's like they were trying to go there, but it didn't really happen. And that's what happened in other soaps. But I think part of the reason why the writers did not entertain that, right? Like they did with, you know, uh, Raj and Holly, Luke and Laura, uh, Jake and Marley, uh, Todd and Blair and countless others, was because there was a whole trial, whole storyline arc. And you would legit undo all of that. Undo this whole process that Todd is trying to reconcile himself with if they were falling in love. And it would feel weird. It would feel weird. Because Marty had too much contempt for Todd. She had way too much contempt. Even though I think, I think uh, Jake and Mar uh, Jake and Marley's also went through a trial too. But Todd and 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 and, and Marty's trial was like the, one of the biggest storyline arcs in life to live at that time, and that would undo the legacy of that. It would definitely just undo the whole entire. It's almost like if GH brought back Stone, you would undo one of the best storylines in GH, right? There's some things you just don't want to touch, and I think that's why the writers never rent that route, which. It's kind of strange that they even went that route with other other storylines, like with Todd and Blair, right? Or Luke and Laura, which we're gonna get to that in a bit. We're, 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 we're gonna get to that in a minute, guys. We're gonna get to that in a minute. We're definitely, we're definitely gonna get to Luke and Laura in a minute, all right? Now, I wanna go into our number three, which is what I wanna talk about, is Luke Spencer. This, this storyline was the most controversial because this was the pairing that saved GH. Um, how does a rapist and his victim become one of the greatest love stories on soaps? Let's sit with that for a minute, right? How does that happen? How does that happen on, on GH? And like I said, Luke and Laura did save GH. No matter how you want to put it, my info about the legacy, that couple saved GH. And I think it was that dynamic at first that was like, okay, we're going to make Luke do this. And... I don't know how the writers did from that point forward. They were just the greatest love story of all time. And without that backstory being considered, because honestly, when I started watching GH, it wasn't until 09, 010 when Lulu uh, killed, I think it was Logan Hayes, was Scott Baldwin's son, that Laura started talking about her journey with her father and everything she found out what Luke did and all that other stuff. And I was like, I didn't know this. I was like, how, are you, how is this the greatest love story of all time? How was that? But then again, you gotta look at Roger, Roger and Holly Thorpe. Roger was just able to go through time after that. And the thing about it is, I think with Luke and the incident with Laura, it was almost like a one-time offense, right? That happened, if I'm not mistaken. I know someone's gonna correct me in the comments. I love correcting me, right? But Roger Thorpe, like that was a whole scene. That scene went on for a long time. It was a whole scene. It was a whole, there was a whole aftermath of that. Luke and Laura didn't really seem to have that. So I think that's why as viewers, we were able to just quickly forget. But Roger Thorpe had that, but yet we were still rooting for him and Holly in this weird way, right? Like, how does that work? How does this work? The thing about it is, is that I'm always viewing my soaps from an analytical point of view. And while I don't need my soaps to be politically correct, um, how do we in 2023 find this balance of telling a story that challenges us, right? Without perpetuating a narrative. Because that has to be the narrative on soaps, you know, the damsel in distress, stuff like that. And people got tired of seeing that. And I think it's because as people, if you keep seeing these images every day, it may skew you to believe that you are a certain type of way yourself, right? So if you're only seeing black people on TV a certain type of way, it can make you think a certain type of way about yourself or if you only, you know, and I think that's why people want the diversity and representation. You want to feel like something else is possible for you. When the people, and the people that you see on TV that look like you. But that's why I also say that's important that I get my diversity and my representation fix somewhere else to make sure I'm still getting it, right? I don't feel deprived. And I can also see other opportunities and other representations of what's out there, right? I think that's kind of important. And so I think that's one of the biggest things in soaps is why we wanted that, right? But how do we tell storylines that challenge us? Storylines days are so PC. You know, there was a storyline on my children, I can't remember the character's name, where one was opposed to the Vietnam War and the other one was. We couldn't do that storyline today in 2023. Um, 
but I know that would offend a lot of people, right? But it is, a, it is a still an ongoing conversation. I've seen people still have those conversations, just like how to vaccinate or not to vaccinate, right? Um, I would have loved to have seen that. I would have loved to have seen a storm like that in General Hospital. I would have, regardless of what my thoughts on it are, right? You want something that's gonna challenge you a little bit. I, I like a challenge. I, I like it when myself's not political because it's, it's that meatiness of the storyline to get you to actually think of these complexities that exist on this canvas, right? And I like that. There was a scene on As the World Turns where Luke came out to his friend Kevin and he says, Luke Snyder is a good man. And uh, I I'll try to play the clip if I can. <laughs> and that word that rhymes with maggot with an M for mother. I can't swim. I'm the king of the world. Kevin, sit down. Look who it is. My friend Luke. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to give a toast to a great guy, a liar, and the faggot! Um, that word that he used, right? Just take that word and put an F in the front. I think you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, that was realistic for me when I watched that. I think I was like 13 when I watched that. And as well turns, that was realistic for me. That was realistic. And I think FCC actually had a policy at the time if they changed it where you were allowed to say certain words on TV once or twice. Just like how all of us, remember show all of us um, with Dwayne Martin where uh, Bobby said the N word that one episode? Because I think the FCC, they, they have certain parameters on how you can say the words. I think it's like only once and they let it slide. After that, they will cut you off the air, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that was realistic. These are realistic moments in soaps. These are realistic moments like that make you actually really think, right? That really think about it. We're looking at Ben Weston, right? He is dealing with the fact that he brutally killed three women, right? Um, this feels a little unrealistic though, like, you know, it feels a little, a little unrealistic. Um, but he brutally killed three women, right? And we're seeing that complexity as he's dealing with aftermath that, but he's like, I'm a reformed person. It's very interesting, right? Who qualifies for redemption in society? This is a question I ask myself when I see this in myself. So who actually qualifies for redemption? And is redemption based on cultural views, right? Based on where the culture is at. Is that determined if a person can be redeemed or not, right? And it determine how severe we see things, right? Because as society, there is a group thing that does happen. I do notice that there is a group thing, right? Whereas one thing was acceptable at one point in society and then it wasn't. But then, even if it wasn't, it can become acceptable again over time. Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun is happening. <laughs> nothing new under the sun is happening, Ecclesiastes. Gosh, um, but even if we look at Terry and, and Chet on GH, which there was a couple that never was, um, a straight man dating a transgender woman, the struggles that they would both face. I would have loved to see that unpack. Maybe Chet would be like, okay, this is maybe gay. What does it say about me? How do I feel about this? You know, even I'm okay, I love Terry, but what about public scrutiny? I would love to see that storyline explored. The thing about it is, is that soaps have set up a way, they've navigated in a way sexual scripts for us. And sexual scripts are pretty much what you understand um, as a gender role is based on your sex, right? So basically like, what do you think a man should be? What do you think a woman should be, right? Um, how you think they should act, how you think they should dress, the dress and how you, how you fit into playing that role and how you try to play that role growing up based on social cues that you learn. That's what sexual scripts are, just in a nutshell. Um, but if you look at Zarf and Zoe and All My Children, Zarf and Zoe, well, Zarf. Zarf, well, Zarf, okay, Zarf. Okay, I'm not gonna get the names right here. Okay, Zarf, okay, All My Children. Zarf challenged those sexual scripts because Zarf was biologically a man, transitioned to become a woman, right? Zarf was transgender. However, he challenges sexual scripts that we normally know transgender individuals to have. He can follow the typical sexual scripts because when we see a transgender woman, we're expecting her to follow the to typical sexual scripts of a woman who was like of a to predominantly follow sexual scripts of a woman who was born uh, biologically a woman. And Zarf did not follow sexual scripts, right? Zarf was like I identify as a woman through the sex, right? But I like to do this, I'm a punk rocker, I do this, and I, and I can, I, I, it, 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 it really challenged that. And not only that, we had that usual notion back in society that a transgender man would be sexually attracted to women, and then that a transgender woman would be sexually attracted to men. But Zarp, as a transgender woman, was attracted to women. It challenged everything we knew about what it actually, what we understood transgender individuals to be. 
Did you notice that? Agnes Nixon was making us even think back then, guys. Did you notice that? Did you notice that, guys? Did you notice? <laughs> Did you notice? Soaps are, to me, that's good soap writing when it makes you think. It makes you think. I know some of you guys like to just be entertained. I like to be entertained too. <laughs> but I like to think a little bit. I didn't even realize that, I want to say till years, I was like, oh wow, like they totally did something totally out of the box that you thought they would have done, right? I didn't like how they made Zarf to be suspected to be a sad slayer. That was just a bit weird. I feel like Zarf should have just had her own standalone storyline. Zoe should have had her own standalone storyline on my children, separate from the satin slayer stuff. That was just, that was just a bit too much going on. It was a bit too much going on. Um, but they tried. I'll give them all my children their credit. They tried. They did try. Sure. But before I get off of that topic, I did want to talk about Luke and Laura um, and for how Jean Francis, that whole legacy really affected her. She felt like Laura was always written as a victim. She even once on the Oprah show that I'm not playing a victim anymore. Yes. And fans are dying to know, will Laura return to the show? Do you want to come back? Or would um, you come back? If there are a way to go forward with Laura and make her into what I would like her to be now, then perhaps I would do it. Uh -huh. uh, but what would I, you like her to be? I, I would like her to be funny and have a little bit of an agenda that might look uh, a little bit vengeful, but it really isn't. I yeah. think she'd have a plan. Yeah. There's nothing in me that is willing to play a victim anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of done with the wounded dove in my life. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Tony and Jimmy, thank you. Thank you. And I get it because when you're constantly playing the role as an actor, as an actress, you know, for those of you guys who grew up in church, you always hear the whole, act as if you got it, right? Act as if you got what God gave you. And then some of you guys in the manifestation spiritual communities, we say, act as if, and you're a desirable manifest. When you act as if you are something, if you keep reinforcing, reconditioning, or condition yourself to something enough, you will come to believe it, right, over time. And even though we're thinking like this is acting, they're probably having the best time of their lives, this is really affecting those people. That's why Maurice Bernard is tired of playing Sonny. It's dark for him. It's a darkness to him, right, when you're playing a character like that. And Jean Francis was constantly playing this damn little stress as a victim that was Laura. She's like, I can't do this anymore. And that was probably spilling and bleeding over into her personal life. Believe it or not, and I, and I think that was what was happening. So she got tired of it. She even told Oprah this, right? And I can understand that in that sense. I really can, I really can understand that in a sense. There might be some parts of the video I might have to cut out. I have to cut out some parts of this video, guys. But this video is meant to really get you to think about these past storylines and what was your take on them. How did you guys feel about it when these storylines came out, all right? And this is not about me being politically correct or DC, what my views are. I really haven't said any of my views on these things, if you noticed. I really have it. You know, if you're really able to deduce that, I really, I really actually haven't said what any of my views are. I'm just bringing what is uh, objective viewpoints to the table, right? And we're dissecting them, that's what we're doing. This is like my own little video essay, kind of like dissect, dissection of all these throwing lines. A lot of these scenes, guys, were hard for me to watch. It was very hard for me to sit down, because obviously before I post these videos, I watch them. And so I'm sitting down, I was like, oh my God, like this is deep, like, oh my God, you know? This is why when I watch telenovelas, I have to watch them, I want to say for about a week and I have to take a break for two weeks, because they, they're kind of intense. They're intense. They're intense, so you feel so much emotion. It's like, oh my God, like for my mental health, I had to take a break. <laughs> but that's how you know the writing is damn good, all right? I was watching this telenovela called El Señor de los Cielos. That's, that's intense. They're on their eighth season now. And then there was An Otra Piel. They were, that was intense too. That, that was too intense. I still haven't gotten through that. La Pastora, I haven't gotten through that either. They're all too intense. It's been three years. I still couldn't get, I still haven't gotten through the whole series yet. It's intense. It's too intense. I have to watch for a month and like take a break because it'd be a lot. It'd be a lot. It's sometimes I'm like watching those telling like, man, why can't the writers let them win? <laughs> but I do like those heavy storylines. I'm not saying I want those kind of storylines, those specific ones, but storylines that really make you think. And it doesn't always have to be violence. I want to make that clear too. I hope you guys actually get to the whole end of this video because some of you guys, I'll be, I'll be seeing how long y'all be up to say to the video. You guys say the whole thing. If you, if you say something in the comments and I, and I can see you didn't stay towards the whole thing, as a matter of fact, if you stayed towards the whole video, put in the word ham right before you write your comment. That's gonna let me know you stayed towards the whole entire video. Put the word ham in, all right? Ham, H-A-M, ham, all right? So anyways, um, that's pretty much the end of this video, guys. I'm exploring these archetypes. Um, this is a very different type of video and I was very hesitant about doing it, but 
I like to explore different things when it comes to soaps. You know how my top fives, and this was about to be a top three or top five video, but I was like, no. It deserves its own standalone category. I mean, Roger Thorpe, Todd Manning, Luke Spence, and Luke had a very tough past as well. You know, with his father and I guess some sexual abuse and stuff that they had that going on in that household. It was, whew. And the thing about it is, that was probably really going on behind the scenes back in the day. And it's probably still going on now. And I understand that people want to see representation, but I do want to see some reality going on in the soaps. I want, I'm okay with the positive representation, but let's see some other things too. Let's see that. Just like Paulina on, 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 on days when she was able to accept Chanel, we saw uh, a black mother accepting her black gay, uh, bisexual daughter, but we still saw there was an inherent struggle. Because most people are just be kind of, you think their families are celebrating them? That didn't happen in real life. If you're gonna write me a storyline, write it real. Write it real. You know, I would have loved to have done a video like this with GH Sunday shit, but I don't know if they probably put down their cup of tea. They probably, uh, you see some things here? Right? Uh, I think they would be vibes, but I don't know. <laughs> I would love to do a video with them. Um, I love the people at GH Sunday shit. Um, but to me, I wanted to do this guy, start this kind of like conversation, you know? Do something different. Um, I was gonna do a typical GH review, but it's not all the time I'm in the mood to do a review on the week and what happened to GH. I like to be intentional with what I put on this channel, what I talk about. Um, and that's just my perspective of that, guys. But, guys, this is the end of my video. I think I've pretty much covered it all. Um, and I do wanna thank you guys for watching. Um, and like I said, because soaps, they definitely challenge us to think and think beyond archetypes and just plots. Um, we cannot be captivated by what we can predict and like we can't be captivated by what we predict and nor can we be ca nor can we like be transformed by it. We can't. And that's a problem I, I said this before in the last video what's the problem with soaps these days is that it's too predictable. We can predict it. So there's not really an impact the show has on us anymore. Right? It's not really an impact. And we're not, with this, the, the storylines don't even have to be at this type of level. Right? That's definitely not what I'm saying. But even we're looking at Maureen Bauer, finding out that Ed had an affair, right? Those kind of storylines, just the way they were written, right? Just, just how we couldn't predict anything in that storyline. Anyways, that, that's storyline for another day, guys. But anyways, guys, this has been Soap Sanctuary, guys. Thank you guys for rocking with me. Uh, I'm gonna try to have this video out by Saturday, hopefully, God willing, God fearing. Um, but thank you guys for rocking me in this channel. I really do appreciate it. Um, this is a tough video for me to make, guys. This is a tough video. But this is like an analysis video. This is not a top three where it's like number one, number two, number three, number three, number five. This is, this is, this is, this is an analysis video. Because um, I thought about this for the longest time in soaps. And why was violence a thing, right? So as I'm even writing this paper um, for my class, there are some things that I'm writing about that I'm like, okay, some sexual desires that people have. I'm like, where does this sexual desire come from? Because I do think most sexual desires are psychological. And I'm not talking, I'm not talking about attraction. That's a different, that's a different. I didn't say it's like attraction is psychological. I said desires. Two different things. All right. Anyways, guys, that is my video on Soap Sanctuary. If you guys have any questions below, let me know in the comments. I'll try to answer them. Uh, please don't act, don't act foolish in the comments. I, I'm not going to answer you act foolish. I don't do foolishness. I'm a nice guy, but I got my limits, all right? But anyways, guys, this has been DC Soap Sanctuary. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the next one. I think this is like 40-some minutes. Hopefully, I can chop it down a bit when you guys see this. But anyways, guys, thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. This has been Soap Sanctuary.